everyone. Hey everyone, uh, Eli Schwartz here, Growth Advisor, um, SEO Consultant. This is our first interview in a series where we're going to be interviewing conference organizers and founders. I owe so much of my career to our guest today, Brett Tabke. Brett got, took a bet on me, let me on a PubCon stage, and I, I never let it go. You know, I've learned so much from being a part of PubCon, met the most amazing people, built connections and lifelong friendships, and just learned so much about search marketing. And one of the people that I, I met from PubCon and built one of those lifelong friendships with, aside from just with Brett, is, is Michael. And, you know, it's just a great honor to be here with him today and, and having this conversation with Brett and talking about conferences and PubCon and COVID, which will hopefully disappear soon. So, Michael. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for saying that. Uh, it's great meeting you too, Eli. Was, uh, I think we met through Gallant, um, uh, through a colleague of mine when I worked for uh, B, uh, business.com, which was a search engine at the time. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Michael Bonfils. I, I run a, a, a group called SEM International, and we do global uh, search marketing and have been doing that since I think we started the company in 2004. So we've been doing this for a while, had another agency before that. Before then, I was at a search engine and I'm aging myself very quickly and going down a very quick, slippery slope at my age and, uh, you know, I'm going through <laughs> midlife crisis right now. So... Um, anyways, uh, so that's that's me. I, I do international. Um, I also owe a lot of my career to Brett, and uh, I'm serious, Brett. I mean, you've been very pivotal, pivotal, and great connections that I've made. All, all I ask is one percent. You know, all I ask is one percent. Checks in the mail. <laughs> okay. Uh, so like I told a guy that, I told a guy that at a conference once and two years later, he came up and handed me a check for 5,000. And he said, this is your 1%. I go, what are you talking about? So if you introduced me to that guy over there and I sold him half of my business yesterday and I promised you, I would give you 1%. So he gave me, <laughs> gave me 5,000. So he bought the bar that night at wow. PubCon. We went to, we went to the breeze bar and said, Hey, open, open bar. You know? so, no way. Yeah. That yeah. True awesome. story. True story. That you asked me not so to tell cool. who it was, but yeah, it was a true story. Oh, that is great. That's <laughs> so awesome. you meet some great people in the search business. I just, of course, best, best friendships I've uh, had all life have been in search business. So yeah, yeah, of course. Well, Brett, why don't you tell us about how'd you how'd you even get into this? Um, gosh, well, this is our twentieth year. Uh, wow, doing trade shows and conferences. PubCon one was late two thousand. Um, so we're just starting our 20th year, 2020, 20. So we even had jerseys and staff stuff made up with 20 all over. <laughs> and now we just want to 2020, we can let's get that off of everything you know, <laughs> after COVID yeah. this year. So, it. Yeah. Uh, well, PubCon started in a, in a, in a pub in London, a group of guys on Webmaster World, uh, forum I built, they decided to go to London and have a, have a pint on a Saturday afternoon and uh, like a hundred marketers showed up. To, to meet them. And they're like, Hey, it's a conference. There's no, it's a pub conference. So that was where the original spark started. And then every conference after that, we tried to do a little more. And then by 2004, we had Matt cuts and a whole panel of search experts come in uh, from the search engines and it just blew up from there. And then we got kind of lucky. Our conference was right after the Florida update in Florida. That's why I named it the Florida update. And so it just blew up from there. We, we went from a hundred people in 2000 to 1600 by 2006. So wow. it, was, it was a great growth tra trajectory. Um, before that I was building websites for people. And before that I worked for gateway 2000 as a, uh, I ran their 24 on 24 line uh, bulletin board system online. So that people would download drivers and stuff for that. I uh, wrote eight bit Commodore software for the Commodore 64 and Commodore 128. So had quite a career in tech, several different distinct phases. <laughs> yeah. so, but. Wow. So you didn't even know this uh, career. You just kind of fell into this conference thing and just well, did it all the last 20 years. You know, in, in the 80s, I did a bunch of those personal growth classes. Uh, it was called Life Spring. It was like Est and that whole ilk forum and all that stuff. And I used to volunteer to help set up the trainings. And one day, I got, one of the facilitators says, dude, you set it up better volunteering 
than the other guy does that we're paying to do it. And it always stuck with me. I, lo I loved all the logistics and behind the scenes. And when the opportunity came to get into conferencing, I'm like, oh, I'm there. That's so what I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I jumped at it full throttle. So, so you had no experience before. No, no, not at all. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I worked, I did trade show booths for Gateway for a couple of years, but yeah. nothing, nothing like running your own show. No, not at all. It was on the job experience. <laughs> so. yeah. do, you, do you still remember your CompuServe email address? I was not a CompuServe. Oh, no. um, I was on there on, on the company's dime anytime I was on there, but okay. uh, <laughs> no, I was, I was people link and uh, what was the quantum link. So, okay. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, talking about something with no experience, I assume you have never had experience doing conferences and events in a pandemic. So, oh, geez. What's Man. the pivot been like? And what, <laughs> what did you? Well, you know a, when it came down? Moment. It came down in March, and we had to can't. It was three weeks before our Florida conference, so we had to cancel that cold. Um, and you know, kind of the general consensus was we'll get a handle on this. You know, flatten the curve. And by middle of summer, late summer, we figured we'd be having conferences again, it really did. And we know how that turned out real quick. Mm. Uh, so I didn't pivot right away. We didn't go virtual. Um, I've kind of had an affinity, well, I won't say against virtual, but oh, 2006, seven, eight, when YouTube was first growing, we tried to get a video play together and I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on video, hired a video producer. We built a video studio in the office, uh, produced several thousand hours of video and we couldn't show anything for it. There was just no path to monetization on it. So I felt pretty burned about video for many years. <laughs> I've had PTSD about video. Um, but the good thing is now the cost of it's come down so much. You know, you, you got a webcam and you throw up a banner and hey, you got yourself a studio. You don't have to spend forty, fifty thousand dollars on green screens and mixers and uh, you know, a good camera used to cost a thousand dollars. Now webcam a hundred bucks and it looks better than those thousand dollar ones did. So I I was late to pivot and really it didn't hit home until August when uh, we had to cancel our Vegas conference. I was convinced in August we were going to have one in Vegas. I'd done everything. We had, uh, I'm fortunate to be married to uh, a doctor of nursing, a professor of nursing. And she sat down with me and we went through everything on the right kind of social distancing and the big convention center, how we were going to lay it out, how we were going to keep everybody safe. And a week later, um, convention center, sorry, we're shut down until the end of the year. And it was at that point where I had the epiphany, okay, the only thing we can do here is go online. That's, that, that's the only thing we can do. Uh, obviously, I'd been in the business and, and watched what had been going on with virtual and how, how the pivot had taken place. So it wasn't easy, but the idea of reaching more people that you can broaden your base online was very attractive to me. And getting back to, to working with small businesses was very attractive to me. So that was where we kind of refocused on small business broadening our audience and in fact our, our conference uh two weeks ago the first week in december we give that away free as a stream on facebook and we had like 3300 interactions clicks uh to play over the two days so that's one of our largest engagements ever so clearly it's working we're going to keep keep working on that in january so that's that's a bit about it so, <laughs> so do, you, do you think real con every anyone's ever going to want to go back to real conference again you know, I think once we get a bit more widespread on the vaccine, um, late March, early April, there is going to be a pinup demand for people to go back to conferences. Yeah. And right now I'm trying to read the tea leaves. When is that going to be? When is that opportunity really going to hit? Is it, is it going to be late April? Is it going to be May? Is it going to be June? Just don't know yet how, uh, how it's going to roll out yet so but there's pinup demand people want to get together so bad in our industry it, it's yeah. it's obvious everybody misses everybody it, you can only do this zoom for so long until it's unfulfilling you know it yeah. just doesn't doesn't have the in-person intimacy so or presence and i would suggest kicking it off in hawaii but that's just my <laughs> well, well it, it's going to be in florida because Okay. I don't think I'm talking out of school, but so we had paid in full for our Florida conference, right. uh, 
and quote an act of God, da, 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 da. there was no refund available, but they were willing to roll it forward. So our next conference is in Florida, come hell or high water. <laughs> so we currently have dates in late April, but I think I'm going to push them again to May if they'll, they'll let us. But the problem there is all these other conferences that got canceled as well, they're wanting dates too, you know, so now it's a pecking order yeah. who gets what and when and where. And so, yeah. Wow. So the, the goal right now is really to keep um, a lot of uh, attraction going and momentum going, at least virtually getting the word out. And right. even if people don't, you know, necessarily make a full commitment to being there, they're, they know about it and they can pick and choose the right. sessions that they want to listen to and, or right. watch. And so I think it, it, yeah, I think it is what you're doing. It's great. You're really getting the word out. It probably hurts you. I'm imagining, I don't know, but I imagine it probably hurts a little bit financially in comparison to the, the, yeah. 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 You're basically going a year without income. I mean, who can sustain that? You know, at some point uh, the savings run out. For me, I let first, staff I let go was in March, uh, left part of, part of the staff go. And then after we had to cancel Vegas in August, I, I let the rest of the staff go. So oh, wow. I haven't grown a salary since March. So there you go. <laughs> I've heard. I've heard. Yeah. Yep. So. Wow. Well, you've been a, a very valuable part of this industry and in connecting people. And, and I think one of the things that, you know, I, I have an amazing amount of respect for is the way you draw in celebrities. Like, uh, Sacha Nadella. Yeah, we had Sacha at a PubCon. Like, um, who are the other? Who are the other famous people? How do you how do you get them to come to PubCon? <laughs> we had Malcolm Gladwell, uh, author of The Tipping Point, had him in Boston. Um, wow. He was just curious about the whole SEO space, and I had a three hour phone call with him. Wow. <laughs> it was unbelievable. He had put the phone down. I'll be back in a minute and. 10 minutes later, you come back and we had this great conversation about search. Okay. Yeah. Well, I got to be at Harvard the day before, so I'll still be in Boston. I'll stop over. So, you know, it's, it's a bit of conjoling. Uh, some speakers we do pay other speakers like uh, Craig Newmark. Uh, I've known him since the eighties. Um, very, very good uh, friend uh, of the industry. He just loves to do that kind of talking. Satya, it was just happenstance. Uh, that was the year they they launched Bing, and we said, "Hey, you want to come out, Mel?" And sure. So, unfortunately, that was right after the crash in 08. Was he? Yeah, I think that was right after the crash, and when we got Satcha out, uh, and so you know, it just really depressed uh, attendance that year. So I felt sorry that we didn't have a very big crowd that year for Satcha. But yeah, you know, you just got to keep talking with people. You just got to keep talking and reaching out and building relationships. So. And sadly, uh, you know, we had Tony Shea too. Uh, I remember uh, that one. Who, who just knew us by reputation. Uh, I think that was the same year as Satcha, actually. And yeah. we may have gotten Tony because of Satcha. So, but. I, I watched that session with Tony and I thought it was great. It was one of my favorite <laughs> all-time uh, yeah. interviews that we ever did. It was just, I, I saw right. the notes somewhere. It was just a really, really good one. And of course, like everybody else, we really miss Matt Cuts. So yeah. <laughs> Matt was always a great draw. So yeah, of course. Wow. All right. So then let's talk about some of the other speakers who um the, the Michaels and Eli's of the world. What what it, what does it take to be a speaker at PubCon? Like, how do you choose them? I know you're uh, unlike other conferences where you've got a you've got a Brett who's running the conference and they're kind of sitting back and having other people do stuff. You are involved. Like you are you. You pick, you're picking the rising stars of our industry. Like, how do you, how do you identify them? Well, number one, they need to have expertise. Number two, like you say, it's a big community and we have a big speaker pool. So people know people. And if somebody speaks for somebody, yeah, I'll go take a look at them. And one of the big benefits we have now is everybody's got a YouTube video. Everybody's got a, a PowerPoint up on SlideShare. Uh, that you can go through and look at and, and see, okay, yeah, this is this is expert level commentary here. Um, who's talking about something we've never heard of before? Who's got a new niche? And so we put them on a panel. We put them on a panel with two, three other speakers, and uh, everybody kind of pulls everybody along to see. And you know, we all speak for each other. When somebody's good, they're good. If somebody's not good, <clears throat> you let me know that too as well. So I really lean on the speakers to help vet new speakers um, as well. So. 
and it's never been easier. It's actually never been easier for us to do that. Uh, it used to be very difficult. Uh, 2005 through about 2010, you know, we had a small speaker pool. Maybe we'd get a hundred proposals for a conference. And then by 2015, 16, we were getting 500, 600, 700 proposals for a single conference. So it, it was, it was, it's slowly become easier. Um, you know, we, we just get our hands in there and look at each and everybody and one of the longstanding complaints we have about PubCon is we have so many speakers who've spoken for a decade for us, like Michael, he's spoken for over a decade for us. But once we vet somebody and we know they're expert in the, the in their whatever field it is, we know they're going to stay current. They're going to be up on the new stuff. They're doing this professionally. They've been vetted. We know their information is good. That's the speaker we want to expose to our community because you know, you can trust the information they're giving out. So. You can't always there, do that with the new speakers. Is there a percentage of new speakers that you choose? Um, I, I, and, I, and I bring that up because I, I, one thing that I find really charming, and you do this, you've done it since as long as I've known this, I've known you. I've seen uh, brand new speakers who've never done it before, and they're scared and they're nervous, and it just, it, all the other expert panels just love them, and so does the audience because it's like, wow, they're really given a chance. They've been thinking about this for weeks. They've been practicing. They're yeah. just like, you know what I mean? And it's really that special moment when you see a new speaker give it their best shot and a little bit shaky, but they're doing their best. Yep. Um, but it's great that you allow that. And so I'm wondering, is there a percentage uh, of, of new speakers that you also think about that like you have a number? Right, right. You know, we see po people pop up all the time, uh, <laughs> pitch new folks. I don't know how they heard about us. Uh, uh, and we'll go check them out and we'll give them an opportunity if they can show that level of expertise. And like I say, they often have somebody speak for them. I, I, I know Eli, I know Michael and I'll come, Hey, Michael, wh what do you think? Oh, she's great. She's great. You know, okay, we'll give them a shot. In fact, one year we had a, uh, an entire track we called open mic track where we just invited folks in to okay here's 15 minutes for you see if you can draw a crowd you know, <laughs> see how it goes and we ended up pulling quite a few speakers out of that open mic uh, track so <laughs> can i can i ping you on something here yeah if we had to create a tweet or maybe something longer than a tweet four tweets what what's the exact requirement how do you get to be able to speak at pubcon how does a new speaker we're going to assume they have some expertise. How do they become a pub con speaker? Number one, you got to pitch. Um, I don't go out and recruit too many speakers. It's fairly rare. We go out and recruit speakers. Generally, the thinking is when you recruit a speaker, other than a keynote, keynotes, we obviously go out and go after. But when you recruit a speaker, that puts the power in the wrong position. They, uh, okay, you came to me. So often when we recruit people that we want, often they want paid and we're like, eh, this is a community here. Here's the situation. Here's how PubCon works. Um, so number one, you got to pitch. You know, we, the standard phrase behind the scenes is if you didn't pitch, you can't bitch. <laughs> you, know? you, can't, you, you can't complain if you didn't get picked, if you didn't pitch to get picked. So number one, they got to fill out a proposal. Number two, absolutely have to be an expert at whatever niche they're pitching for. Just tell us, speak from their expertise. That's number two. They got to speak from their expertise to their expertise and try and guess what we want in a speaker. Don't try and fill whatever void you think PubCon serves our, our audience. That's not it. We want you speaking from your expertise. Whatever that personal expertise is, that's what we want to dig into. Number three, if you know somebody on already on the speaking crew, have them put in a word for you, you know, have somebody reach out. Uh, and number four, have something unique. You know, if we've heard the same case study 15 times from the same company, um, it's like we have several speakers from IBM and they go way out of their way to make sure they don't overlap and that it's something unique and they don't quote the same sources. And here they're all on the same team. They could easily put the same presentation together real quickly. So we want uniqueness. We really want something that we haven't seen before that maybe is inspiring or uplifting or a new type of case study based on their real world experiences. We so want people to give their own uh, what they saw 
you know, not what the common industry knowledge is, what everybody with the herd is following. So that's kind of what gives us our unique flavors because we'll have two speakers get up and completely contradict each other. <laughs> and we're like, well, which one is right? Don't know, but that's food for thought for, <laughs> for later. So you can dig into it yourself. So can we say number four is the most important? <sighs> Uniqueness. Yeah, for sure. For sure. All right. Yep. Yep. And I, I, I know from my own experience, I, I mean, the, when I customized a presentation to make it as unique as possible, I got packed rooms and long lines and everything else because of that, you know, that one on, um, I did that psychological behavior one where I changed it up a bit and I tested the audience and made them profile themselves and then did the presentation. And people were come after that, they were coming at me with all kinds of ideas that just triggered in their mind. And that's what you're saying, Brett, is what draws people back to PubCon. It's like, I got a golden nugget out of this conference. Mm -hmm. you know? We generally ask everybody to come up with a unique deck for PubCon. We don't yeah. want you to give the same deck you might've given at the local Rotary Club or the local marketing club. So it's, it's a different audience. So uh, let's get a different deck. <laughs> Doesn't nope. always work out that way. Uh, we had a couple instances in the in 2006 through 2009 where somebody got up with another conference's template and gave their oh. <laughs> Happened multiple times. We finally had to, okay, guys, use the tenor template. <laughs> Is that your biggest pet peeve or do we have another one? No, uh, you know, probably the only pet peeve is Speaker shows up the day. Oh, I brought along my friend Bob. Can he come watch all the sessions with me? <laughs> no, we <he> can't. <laughs> and that happens more than more than you think. You know, uh, we kind of yeah. nip that in the bud, though. <laughs> that never even occurred to me. Next PubCon, I'm bringing my family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even that last Vegas one, we had somebody show up at uh, registration. Well, what do you mean my husband can't set through all the sessions with me? Well, he can set through your session, but then he has to leave. <laughs> That's nice that you allowed that at least. I oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We give session pass. We do. We got a session pass for spouses. So okay. That's yeah. Good. No. Yeah. I I I have gotten people come up, coming up to me and asking that. Hey, can you think you can get Brett to get me in? And I'm like, I can give you a discount code. You know, <laughs> speaker discount code. And that's that's why we started that back in the day, Michael. That's absolutely why we started that. So that you had a weapon to offer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's awkward. It, I always feel kind of awkward, especially if it's a client, you know, and it's like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they're going to want you to pay for it. <laughs> yeah, don't say that on, uh, on a podcast. That's going to be the best thing. <laughs> but that's okay. All right, well, let's wrap up with the, the biggest secret possible to being successful as a speaker at a conference. Like, how do you, like what, if you had to give somebody a tip we know that they're going to be unique for PubCon. How do they kick off a speaking career? How do they speak a kickoff? Well, number one, have, have something unique. You, you just have to have a unique bit of your own expertise that's, that's going to captivate people. You know, the biggest problem speakers have when they first speak is literally they don't practice enough. They don't practice enough to get comfortable speaking. Uh, it really shows up now that we're doing virtual events because everybody's so comfortable. Uh, even our guys doing the master's group training, we ask them for eight hours of content and they talked a little bit slower when they were doing it on camera than they did in person because they didn't have that little bit of nervous energy that helped them talk a little faster. And instead of eight hours of content, they gave us 10 and a half. <laughs> so <laughs> we had to figure out what to do with two and a half extra hours. And Joe's like, it's the same talk I give last year. How did I go this far over? And it just comes down to practicing and practicing and practicing and practicing. Um, it sounds dumb. It is, but you got to practice over and over. And especially on Zoom, uh, watch yourself. You got to watch yourself. You got to get to the point where you're comfortable watching yourself and listening to yourself on Zoom. Everybody hates listening to themselves the first thousand times they do it, but do it a thousand times, thousand and one. Hey, I actually agree with that guy talking there. I wish I would have said that. Oh, wait, that was me saying that. <laughs> so, so, so practice on Zoom, practice, practice, practice. Um, after that, try and be engaging and not in a glitchy kind of, you know, gimmicky way, but ask questions of the audience, you know, get them to look up from their phone for five seconds and not 
15 bullet points, but maybe a decent graph, a decent picture from your own experience that was something unique. So, you know, the, the ingredients that go into a good speaker are pretty varied. Um, I watched a gal in Florida, 2004. Uh, she shook so much getting on stage that she turned around to drink a cup of water during her speech so she didn't so she could lean over and didn't spill it on herself she was that nervous she gave just a, a five-star presentation and she went on and i'm not going to call her out because i didn't get her permission but she, she's an industry veteran now uh widely respected and entire uh, entire uh marketing specter and people line up to go see your sessions so there's a chance for everybody i think there's a chance for everybody to become a good speaker wow well brett it's really been an honor to know you it's been an honor to have this discussion with you today i really appreciate it I'll well thank you guys I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you so good luck with the podcast well, thank hey, you. well, you're the first you've kicked off so many careers you're kicking off a great podcast here mm -hmm. cool cool so, yeah. Thanks, Brett. Mike, you have any last words? Yeah, well, again, thank you, Brett. Uh, thank you for the years of uh, allowing me to participate in such a great conference. You know I'm a big fan and a huge supporter of PubCon. I always have been and always will be. So anything we can do to help you. And, uh, you know, I, I know these are trying times, but I think it's going to be a, even more of a benefit in the future. I can't I can personally cannot wait for the next one. I'm so excited about it. I'm like, we'll be there, I promise. Even if you don't allow me to speak, I'm going to be sitting there in front with a little flag. Well, our next online, <laughs> our next online one, we're announcing uh, yet today. So yeah. our next online one. So January 20th and 21st, we're going to do a lo local services conference online. So Oh, that's awesome. All right, okay. January 20th and 21st. Thank you so much, Brett. Thanks, Michael. Thank, Thank you, guys. Talk